It is here that the flooded forest is found. Unlike the upland rainforest, this forest is adapted to survive long periods of flooding each year. Incredibly, many of the saplings and other small trees are completely submerged for six to nine months each year. But nevertheless, they are able to stay not only alive, but also green under the water. Over 2% of the entire Amazon rainforest is invaded by the rivers each year an area nearly as large as the British Isles. This most curious of rainforests, the flooded forest, is the home of some of our planet's most beautiful and remarkable creatures. One of the least expected animals to be found swimming between the trees is a dolphin. Unlike any other dolphins, the boto is as much at home in the forest the flooded forest, that is, as in the open waters. Although the flooded forest makes up only about 2% of the total Amazonian rainforest, it is nevertheless an extremely important link in the lives of many animals. With rising water, the flooded forests are not only invaded by water, but also by many fish. The Amazon has the greatest variety of freshwater fish in the world. All of Europe has only about 300 species of fish whereas the Amazon has at least 2,000. Perhaps as many as another thousand species await discovery in the giant river system. Most Amazon fish depend to some extent on the flooded forest for shelter and food. Instead of birds flying between the lower layers of the forest, fish now swim. Although boto dolphins are nearly blind, they are able to find their way through the labyrinth of forest by using a type of sonar or echolocation. The boto is unique. Unlike most other dolphins, the boto has a flexible neck and is able to sweep its head back and forth to produce a very wide sonar image of its environment. This highly sophisticated navigational skill allows it to weave in and out of the trunks and branches of the flooded forest in search of fish. The richness and diversity of the flooded forest attracts many different kinds of life. The abundance of fish provides the main food for most predators, such as the big-headed turtle. Heavily armored, these river turtles have few predators themselves. The people who live along the rivers are called caboclos. These rural inhabitants are a mixture of Indian, European and African peoples. They depend on the flooded forest for much of their subsistence food and still use many of the fishing and hunting techniques learned from the native Indians. The caboclos live along the edge of the rivers and forests. Canoes are their major means of transport and rivers their highways. When flood water becomes high, caboclos can actually paddle through the canopy of the forest. It takes considerable skill to navigate through the maze of water and trees without getting lost. Parents teach their children at a very early age how to find their way in the world of the flooded forest.
Only the higher canopy remains untouched by the flood waters. Here in the upper branches are some of the most unusual and secretive animals of the entire Amazon. The white-balled wakari monkey is found only in the flooded forests of the Amazon, and even here, only in a small region of it. These monkeys have evolved an amazing ability for jumping between the flooded trees. This allows them to reach a larger number of food trees in their home ranges, which otherwise would be inaccessible to them. Wakaris are found in troops made up of about 50 individuals. A wakari troop spreads out widely within its home range and splits into smaller groups of four or five individuals in a single tree. While fish swim among the lower branches of the trees, the wakaris leap about in the upper branches in search of their favorite food, fruit. The white-balled wakari is also called the English monkey perhaps because of its resemblance to sunburnt tourists or gin-drinking Englishmen. Perhaps the most unusual bird of the flooded forest is the huatzin. It is peculiar not only because of its appearance, but also because of its diet. Huatzins are entirely vegetarian, and one of their favorite foods is the giant arum plant. Few animals are able to digest the thick and fibrous arum leaves. After the leaves and other plant material are swallowed, they are first fermented so that they can be digested. The fermentation results in a foul smell, and it is for this reason that they are sometimes called stink birds. Watsons breed during the floods because food is abundant and surrounding water will provide additional protection for nests and young. Adult male wakaris must be one of the most striking and unusual looking monkeys in the world. As the male matures, the hair on his head recedes and his face becomes very red. This stands in striking contrast to his full coat of body hair. Wakaris appear much larger than they really are because of their thick coats. In fact, adult males are only about 40 to 50 centimeters long and weigh less than four kilograms. In contrast to the male, the female does not become so bald or red with age. She also lacks the large bulbous forehead of the male. There is a theory that the red face has evolved as a health indicator, especially for the presence of malaria. When males have malaria, their faces turn very pale. Thus, females can gauge how fit their prospective mates may be. A diseased monkey would be rejected by the female as a mate. Possibly through the sexual selection, the wakari's face has become even redder.
Wakaris usually give birth to only one baby. During the first year of life, an adolescent like this one becomes virtually independent and can search for food on its own, although the mother is usually nearby. The lives of the caboclos are closely linked to the plants and animals of the flooded forest. From an early age, the children are fascinated by forest animals and keep some of them as pets. Ideally located between the river and the forest, caboclos have ready access to both fish and game. The caboclos supplement their fish and game diets with manioc, which they plant. The manioc root is grated and then roasted in an open oven to make a coarse, bland flour, somewhat resembling gritty sawdust. This flour is called farinha and provides most of the starch for their diets. The rich knowledge about the plants and animals that the caboclos possess was inherited from the experience that native Indian cultures gained from living in the Amazon for thousands of years. This understanding of the forests and rivers is essential for the caboclos because of their reliance on fish and game. Temperatures are relatively high throughout the year in the Amazon. Rainfall is much more variable and there are distinct wet and dry seasons. In most of the Amazon, the main rains fall between December and May. The vast area of the Amazon Basin is pounded by more than two meters of rainfall each year. Near the Andes, the total can exceed three meters. After several months of heavy rains, the river channels become swollen, and then the floodplains are invaded by rising water. They remain flooded for up to seven months each year. Water level can rise two or three meters each month and quickly the lower part of the flooded forest become completely submerged. As water level rises, even some of the animals living in the forest canopy must face drastically different conditions. The three-toed slope is usually seen motionless and hanging upside down on the top of the tree. However, sloths are excellent swimmers. They appear to swim in slow motion, but are quite able to cross river channels as well as swim inside the flooded forest. Their swimming ability may be the principal reason why they are so widespread in the Amazon. Not even the world's largest river is a barrier to them.
At the peak of the high water period, the flooded forest is transformed into a rich orchard. Many of the fruits hang just above the water. Most of the trees and vines begin to fruit at the time of the floods to take advantage of the water to disperse their seeds. However, dispersal by water is not always successful since many of these seeds are especially high in protein and fat and this makes them attractive food for many animals. In most forests, birds, mammals and insects are the usual seed eaters. In the flooded forest, however, fish are the most important seed predators. The tambaki is the largest fish that is a seed eater. It reaches over a meter in length and can weigh more than 30 kilograms. Tambaki have huge nasal flaps which help increase the flow of water into the nose, thus enhancing their keen sense of smell. This helps them to locate fruiting trees by smelling them out. Seeds have evolved various ways to protect themselves against predators. The rubber tree seed is encased in a shell nearly as hard as that of a Brazil nut. This protects it against most animals. Amazingly, the tambaki has incredibly strong jaws and massive molars that are reminiscent of those of a horse. With this specialization, the large fish is able to crack the hard nuts to get at the nutritious kernels inside. When rubber trees are fruiting, tambaki lurk beneath them to take the seeds as soon as they fall into the water. These giant nutcrackers destroy a large part of each year's crop. Fish can also be seed sowers. The seeds of fleshy fruits often escape being cracked in the fish's mouth and pass unharmed through the gut. This journey through the fish may also fertilize the seeds and help in their germination. High water is a time of plenty for fruit-eating fish. They accumulate large amounts of fat in their bodies as an energy reserve that can be used when food is scarce. These fattened fish also make good food. Dolphins are the top predators in Amazonian waters. Using its highly developed echolocation and its long beak armed with many pointed teeth, the Boto dolphin is well equipped to pinpoint and capture fish. The juvenile dolphin insists on sharing its mother's catch. Perhaps because the mother is willing to share her fish, a young boto dolphin will remain at its parent's side for more than a year. Botos consume enormous quantities of fish in order to sustain their active lives. An adult may eat up to four or five kilos of fish every day. Caboclos understand the intimate relationship between the fish and the forest. 
This knowledge is important because fish is the main source of protein for their families. As a fisherman paddles through the branches and the canopy, he listens for the sounds of fruit dropping into the water and fish splashing. From these distinct sounds, the fisherman can locate fruit-eating fish. An individual tree might have its fruit dropping into the water for a month or more, at which time fish concentrate below it. When a rubber tree is scattering its seeds, the fisherman knows that tambaki will be in the waters below. Fishing techniques are a combination of indigenous methods and caboclo inventions developed over the last two or three centuries. The gill net is the most important modern addition. When fish swim into it, they become entangled and cannot escape. The gill net is very effective for catching large tambaki. An adult tambaki will make a good meal, even for the largest caboclo families, which often have more than 10 children. South America is known to naturalists as the fruit continent. Trees here produce an enormous variety of fruit. Not only are fish feeding below, but there is also a feast in the canopy. The bounty of fruit is responsible in part for the diversity of fish in the waters and also for the large number of animals attracted to the canopy at this time of year. Monkeys are among the most important of the fruit eaters in the flooded forest canopy. Perhaps the most common fruit eating primate is the squirrel monkey. Among the largest of Amazonian monkeys is the red howler, reaching six kilograms in weight. Though howlers can feed on several types of food, their favorite is fruit. The fruiting season is an ideal time for monkeys to have their young, as both the mother and the youngsters are guaranteed an abundance of food. The Amazon has more fruit-eating birds than anywhere else in the world. These fruit-eaters come in many shapes, sizes and colours, such as the white-throated toucan, which is as much beak as body. Here, an arasari toucan uses its massive bill as a tool for reaching and manipulating fruits. Hanging by your feet is another method to reach fruit, if you are a wakari, that is. Unlike most Amazonian monkeys, wakaris have short tails, which are of little use for grasping. Fruit pulp and seeds together supply a high energy and protein diet for the monkeys. The main fruiting season comes during the floods and lasts about four or five months. However, not all the species are in fruit at the same time. When the fruit crop of a favorite tree type is exhausted, the monkeys can turn to other species. Despite the lack of a prehensile tail, wakaris are as agile as other Amazonian monkeys and able to move about effortlessly in the flooded forest canopy in their continuous search for food. The Amazon has the largest number of monkey species in the New World. Most of the species are found, at least to some extent, in flooded forests. Many of these monkeys migrate from neighboring upland rainforest during the floods to take advantage of the abundance of fruit. One of the most enterprising monkeys to do this is the black capuchin. Nearly all of the fruits of the flooded forest orchard are forbidden to man.
because they are too poisonous for him to eat. However, man indirectly taps the bounty by harvesting fruit fattened fish. During the low water period, Tambaki fast. Now, in the flood time, they gorge themselves. After a few weeks of feeding heavily on rubber tree seeds, Tambaki become very fat. A 20 kilo fish, such as this one, will have nearly one kilo of rubber tree seeds in its stomach. In the flooded forest, under a rubber tree, we see in a nutshell the interaction between man, fish and plant. When the rubber tree seeds no longer fall, both the tambaki and the fisherman must search for other ripe fruits. Some fruits, like those of the jara palm, remain green for a long time. Others, like the large fruits of the jawari palm, are already falling into the water. Fishermen bait their hooks with these jawari palm fruits. They know that fish can detect falling fruit not only by sight and smell, but also by sound. Jawari fruits make a loud splash when they hit the water. By using a device called a gaponga, the fisherman can imitate the sound of jawari fruits falling into the water. In his other hand, the fisherman uses a pole and line with a fruit-baited hook. A tambaki is attracted by the sounds and unawares takes the baited hook. Giant electric eel is also reputed to eat some kinds of palm fruit, but its usual fare is fish. The electric eel stuns its prey with an electrical shock of up to 500 volts produced from its muscles. Once stunned, the fish can easily be swallowed. The eel is an air breather, and its mouth is also a lung. One reason for stunning and immobilizing its prey is that the eel cannot afford to have a struggling fish damage its tender mouth. The caboclos claim that giant electric eels also use their electricity to shock some kinds of trees in order to dislodge fruit. But whether electric eels can actually do this still remains a mystery. Most of the great diversity found in the flooded forest lives in the shade, well protected from the strong sun. At the river's edge, outside of the flooded forest, conditions are very different. Here, exposed to the full force of the sun, grow patches of arum. These arum communities are able to float and can ride on top of the floods. At the height of the floods, Kowatsin parents feed heavily in these arum patches in order to get enough food for themselves and for their young. Kowatsins usually nest in trees that are near arum patches. Their nests are built on limbs just above the water. Kowatsins usually lay two eggs, but occasionally three. The chicks are fed fermented arum puree, regurgitated by the parents. Their nest is at best a crude affair, a simple platform of twigs. When the chicks are about two weeks old, they begin to wander short distances from the precarious nest. Superficially, young Hoatsins look like the famous fossil bird, called Archaeopteryx. 
long thought to be an evolutionary link between reptiles and birds. Although we now know that Hoatzins are not related to Archaeopteryx, they nevertheless possess the same peculiar wing claws of the ancient bird. At the tip of each wing is a claw. As the chicks mature, the wing claws disappear. Hoats and chicks spend several weeks clambering about on branches and this helps them build up the strength they will need to become independent. Parents try to keep a watchful eye on the chicks but this is not always easy since the young are very active. It is not just the parents that protect their young, but other adults in the vicinity will also offer help to the chicks if either the mother or father is not nearby. This additional help is very useful, since baby Hoatzins are so mobile and often out of sight of their parents. The remarkable animals of the Amazon have provided the base for a rich folklore no animals draw as much attention as the dolphins. The activities of fishermen attract boater dolphins who come close to investigate what is happening. It is the intelligence of boaters and their inquisitive nature that makes them the prime candidates for folklore tales. Caboclo sometimes claimed that the boto is a natural lifeguard and will help drowning people to shore. Others believe that if you kill or harm a boto, it will bring bad luck and ill health. But the most common and amusing story is that at night male botos transform themselves into handsome men. These impostors then go ashore and join in with village festivities in order to seduce young girls. Botos are a useful scapegoat for unexpected pregnancies. Because of this folklore, there is a taboo against killing the boto for food. These myths have helped guarantee the survival of this unique dolphin. many predators emerge from their daytime hideouts. Among the largest spiders in the flooded forest are tarantulas. Flooded forest tarantulas make their silk-lined nests in the crevices of trees well above water level. Here they ambush insects that have been forced upward by the high water. Thank you. 
It is during high water that the arowana breeds. And it is the, the young are allowed out to feed on microscopic plants and animals in the water. They only stay out of the father's mouth for a few seconds before they are scooped up and returned to the safety of their nursery. The male broods the eggs and young for about a month. With this mouthful, he is unable to feed, but must rely on fat reserves built up from heavy feeding in the flooded forest. The Boto dolphins periodically check fishermen's nets for a free meal. This is certainly less work than catching fish for themselves. The dolphin has to be careful not to get entangled in the gill net where it might be drowned. It uses echolocation to get a clear picture of exactly where to pluck the fish out of the net. Fishermen generally accept that they will lose part of their catches to the dolphins. Even this loss, however, does not diminish their respect for the botos. These fishermen believe there is sufficient fish for both man and dolphin. The coming of the dry season is first felt in the canopy. Succulent fruit becomes scarce and wakaris will have to rely on other foods. As rainfall diminishes over the Amazon basin, the level of the rivers begins to fall. The character of the flooded forest is changed radically as water level drops and starts to drain into the river channels. Caboclos can no longer fish in the flooded forest but must rely on the floodplain lakes and river channels. The dramatic change in water level also affects the inhabitants of the flooded forest. Botos too are forced to retreat out of the flooded forest. Fish gather in tens of thousands of individuals to form enormous schools that migrate out of the emptying forest and into the river channel. Dolphins follow these schools of fish. Pulse of life moves in the vast Amazon system as animals flee the draining forest for the river channels and lakes. Once in the main rivers, some schools of fish swim upstream in large migrations. Each year, driven by a strong instinct to disperse, the fish migrate hundreds of kilometers in the Amazon and its tributaries. At rapids, the journey upstream is slow. The fattened fish fight relentlessly against the rushing waters. Fishermen wait perched on the rocks, ready to take their share of the riches of the flooded forest. 